What a blessing it is to worship. We have a whole lot of uh, our worship team that's up in North Florida. And uh, I, I think that our sort of seasoned team, it's not, it's not the young people. They did pretty good, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but what a blessing, what a blessing. Uh, we are in a series in uh, the book of Nehemiah, actually Ezra and Nehemiah, all one book, uh, as we've been saying, and I've called it Building Back Boulder. It's about this time of rebuilding uh, in the history of Judaism, in the history of our people uh, in Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the city. And we've been following that along. It's, it's been, it takes like 90 plus years for this all to take place. And uh, we're finally to this point where the rebuilding is almost complete. It's almost done. I mean, really, all of the structural things are there. And we're looking at just a few more things. The, the temple had been rebuilt. The altar had been set. They had begun to do the practice of, uh, of, the, of the sacrifices and the rituals there in the temple. Uh, the people were living uh, primarily in the villages outside. They, weren't, they hadn't really moved in very much yet. Uh, but finally, they had the walls and the gates. That was Nehemiah's task. They had the walls and the gates are in place, and it's starting to look like a city. Uh, it's still working on a few things. Uh, people were moving in. Uh, but there was one more thing that needed to be accomplished. And the question that I'm asking uh, this weekend is, how does God rebuild the hearts of the people? Another way to ask that is, how do we avoid the same mistakes that led to this destruction about 100 years prior? If you remember and you've read along, you know, the Jewish uh, people, they come out of uh, Egypt, the slavery in Egypt, the great exodus, and then they had come, and it wasn't very long before things started messing up. It seems like every time they have a high point, uh, they have sort of a disaster that happens. And so we would see a good king and a bad king and a good king and a bad king. Uh, there was social injustice and there was idolatry. So how do they turn their hearts toward home? Uh, that's the theme we're looking at. Last weekend, we talked about the elements of revival. And how it begins with the word. They read the word for like half a day. Uh, they read from the Torah. Uh, and then uh, that moved them into worship. Amazing time of worship. And then they, they were anchored in the joy of the Lord. Uh, the leader said, the joy, this, what we're experiencing now, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Why don't we say that to, to one another? Turn to someone next to you and say, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say it again nice and strong. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And then out of that, they were drawn to confession. They began to confess their sins. They said, we, we realize in this moment of joy that we have messed up and, uh, and we have been neglecting some things. And so the question is, what, what next? What, what's the next part? And at the end of chapter 9, you'll remember that the leaders began to sign a covenant, a commitment to the covenant so that uh, they would be committed as a, as a whole to fulfilling the things uh, that were prescribed in the Torah. Uh, chapter 10, which is where we are, uh, begins by giving a list of those who put their seal and their name, their signature onto this document. And then um, beginning in, in verse 28, we see the actual commitments that they were making. And that is our scripture for today. So I invite you to give your whole attention and focus without distraction upon Nehemiah chapter 10, beginning verse 28. Uh, you'll find that on page 406 in the Bibles that are out there. If you don't own a Bible, change that today. Take one of those Bibles home with you, put your name in it, and begin to read and study the Word of God. So let's hear the Word. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers the temple servants and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. 
And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We will also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. For the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We The priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God. According to our fathers' houses, at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the first of every tree, the wine of the oil and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God to the chambers of the storehouse for the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Now let's stand and let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for these momentous times in history, these turning points of commitment and recommitment. And we pray that you would speak to us out of this word, speak to us clearly the things that you would have us to hear, the things that you would have us to change, the things that you would have us to turn in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And be seated. Last week we talked about confession. And all this week as I began to study the scripture uh, for for us today, uh, it occurred to me that confession of our sin is empty if it's not accompanied by change. Confession of our sin is empty if it is not accompanied by change. So let's look on the next slide there. There we go. And let's say that together. Confession of our sin is empty if it is not accompanied by change. We say this all the time. Really, a child may come and say, well, I'm sorry. Say, well, what are you going to do about it? Or, or an adult may say that. Well, I'm sorry. Well, are you going to make sure that doesn't happen again? There has to be change. So we've seen this movement of word and worship and joy and confession. And the fourth element is repentance. The turn, the change that needs to take place. And we're in a season of Lent where we think about repentance. We think about confession. It's what we do. A lot of people are focused in specific ways on trying to listen to God and say, what do you want changed in my heart, in my life? So Israel had had this history of failure, even after times of revival, even after times of connection. And so they wanted to put this in writing. They wanted to write this down and make sure everybody, and probably Nehemiah was leading in this. It's one thing to say, okay, uh, we're going to do better. It's another thing to say, we're going to put a seal and a signature to this. Nehemiah 9.38, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. 
Now that term, make covenant, is the Hebrew, karat berit, which literally means to cut covenant. Uh, co covenants were cut. Actually, in, in the earliest times, uh, if they were going to make a covenant, and you'll find this in, in the Torah and the scripture, they would sacrifice an animal, cut it into pieces, either four or eight pieces, put it out in different places on the ground, and they would walk in between the pieces uh, that were on the ground. And it, as they cut the covenant, and it was a way of saying, if I don't keep this covenant, may it be to me like it has been to this sacrificed animal. How's that for strong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. And so uh, in chapter 10, the citizens um, of this new Jerusalem, they, they got to sign the covenant. It's a little bit different. They, there wasn't any cutting going on. Um, but it, it's a, a powerful thing because in those times of failure, it had been really bad. I mean, you remember the story that was pictured there in the last slide, how uh, Moses was up on the mountain and, and these people had seen more power of God. They had seen the Red Sea part. They had seen all these miraculous things happen to get them out. And here they were in the desert and Moses is up on, on the mountain for a little longer than they wanted. And so they said, well, what, what are we going to do? Maybe we should make a golden calf. <laughs> oh, real smart. <laughs> and so because of those kinds of failures and, and the failure of Solomon. I mean, Solomon had all these intermarriages that really messed things up. So they're saying, you know, because of this, uh, we're going to make a, a firm covenant. In chapter 10, we see uh, the signatures go on to this document. And I call it the New Jerusalem. Now, we know that in Revelation chapter 21, it talks about the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband, okay? But at this point, this is a New Jerusalem, another New Jerusalem. They have been in rubble. We sometimes call it the Phoenix City. Well, rising up out of the ashes. And that's exactly what was happening. Out of the rubble, God was raising up this new Jerusalem as his holy city. So the civic and religious leaders, they were putting their seals on this document. 22 priests and Levites and 44 chiefs are named in the first 27 verses. I, I decided not to read all of those names. Uh, but, uh, and by chiefs, it means leaders or the heads of families, representative of whole Families were putting their seal on that. And there were three areas of repentance in the covenant that, that we just read. Their commitment to covenant. And they are family, Sabbath, and giving. That's what we're going to be looking at today. These three different areas. And it, it, it was obviously because these were the areas in which they had been failing. We've been neglecting. We've been messing up in these three different areas we want to make it straight. It could have been a different three items, but these were the three um, that they were bringing before the Lord as a recommitment. So first they wrote down something about family and marriage. It's the very first thing. And they said in verse 3, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land. The, these people, the Hittites and the Ammonites and all the Jebusites and all these people that are around, uh, uh, we want, we're not going to give our daughters in marriage to them. And we are not going to receive their daughters into our families for our sons. And they, they had not been doing that. They had not been protecting the integrity of the families of the faith. And that was really critical. There really, as it ends up from this point on, there's this realization. Few things are more threatening to Jewish identity than a religiously mixed marriage um, you know you see it in Fiddler on the Roof um, where the daughter Hava she says I'm going to marry uh, the young man the Russian Gentile young man and, uh, and Tevya and Golda have to really wrench and struggle with this and finally Tevya says go home Golda we have other children Hava is dead to us that's I mean this is an expression that was used now by the end he recants on that he blesses them finally I mean, that's the struggle, the tension in, in that drama. But this is the kind of thing that they were struggling with, and it's rooted here. So much of modern Judaism is, is being birthed right here. I mean, we know the Torah is important. We know that the, the sacrifices of the temple are important, but this is where the word is being uh, put into practice in these powerful ways. In Ezra, we actually learned that this had been happening for some time. Uh, and, and not just 
with the kids um, in Ezra chapter 9, and we studied that last fall, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, with their, their uh, idolatries. For they have taken, our leaders, saying, have taken some of their daughters, their daughters, uh, to be wives for themselves, for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. So at some point, some of these leaders had said, you know, I really want a, a wife, and I've gotten to know some of the Ammonites, and, and one of my Ammonite friends has a really, really cute daughter. I want that daughter to come and be my wife. So that, that's what they have been doing. And these mixes wouldn't be bad because of uh, just the nationalities and things like that, but it was bringing into each home an idolatry, uh, the idolatrous practices of, of these brides, you know, and vice versa, uh, giving uh, our daughters over into those homes. And actually in Ezra, we studied this, how the pagan wives were to be put away, divorced. Now, we don't have any evidence that that actually happened, but I think the pressure was on, you need to start learning Torah. You need to start practicing our faith to be part of our family. And that's what happened in, in the book of Ezra. And many think that most of these wives uh, converted and began to study God's word. And part of that is because the prophet Malachi, at the same time, prophet Malachi is preaching, and he says, he brings the word of God where God says, I hate divorce. It's not what I'm after. I'm not after divorce uh, because that's a kind of violent thing. But to have those that are coming in be converted, become a part of our faith. So religious intermarriage was the issue. Really important to understand. Jewish people could marry anybody from any other nation if they converted and were instructed in the ways of the Jewish people. Now, how do we know that? How about Moses? Moses married a Cushite. That's Africa. Uh, he married a dark African woman who was his wife. And so we know it's not about race. We know it's not about nationality. We know it's about an unconverted pagan wife coming in and being part of the family and disrupting what was going on. So foreign wives, when we see that, especially in the book of Ezra, we see foreign wives, that was not about nationality, it was not about ethnicity, it's not about, oh, you can't marry someone from another part of the world, not, it's not that at all. Uh, but the leaders had, had married women who did not adhere to the faith of Israel, they did not worship Yahweh, and this um, was all about passing the genuine faith to the next generation, so critical. The second thing uh, that is raised uh, in their commitment is observing the Sabbath fully. We call it Shabbat. Say that with me, Shabbat. And that's how it's said in Hebrew. And if you ever go to Israel, I hope you will, uh, you should say it, Shabbat. And you'd say, oh, is this Shabbat? Yes, Shabbat's beginning. And the, and the way you greet is you say, Shabbat Shalom. Say that with me, Shabbat Shalom, which means peace to you on this Sabbath. That's how you, you welcome the Sabbath. So they have been observing Sabbath in their homes. Sabbath literally means stop. It literally means cease, quit. And God, God had created this within creation. On, on, the, on the seventh day, he stopped. It says to rest. He stopped to rest. Do you think God was tired? No, he wasn't tired. But he stopped as a way of, of connecting Shabbat and our need for rest, creation's need for rest into the creation itself. So this day was established uh, by God. It is a Sabbath both to the Lord and it is a gift to man. In, in Exodus 20, it says it is a Sabbath to the Lord. It's not just a day off. I, I like to take a day off. Sabbath is different. It is to the Lord, but Jesus said, I am Lord of the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's for your benefit. If you go and go and go and never have a Sabbath, you never spend time with God and never take a day off, you will get sick. 
How do I know that? I've tried. Yeah. <laughs> so I won't go into all those stories. But families, they, they, they need a, a time to, to stop. And also, what about business? And that's what they focus on here, commerce on the Sabbath. Apparently, there were nearby traders uh, who wanted to do business on the Sabbath. Uh, in, in verse 31 again, and if the peoples of the land, these surrounding ites, uh, the Jebusites and Ammonites and all those folks, uh, and if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath. We're not going to do business on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Now, that exists to this time. One of the marvelous things, if you visit Israel, is how everything starts winding down after about noon on Friday. And then as you get to about 3.30 in the afternoon, it's really starting to shut down. You say, what's going on? There aren't as many cars on the road. Everybody seems to be headed you know, home, and, and the shops are starting to close up. It's the beginning of the Shabbat. And it's in the, in the mid-afternoon is when the rabbis say, that's when you need to start. You need to start winding down. And there, you know, most things are closed on the Sabbath, on, on that Shabbat. And, and so that's practiced. Well, it's not all that easy to turn away business uh, when business comes. How many of you know that? And I, I looked it up. Well, I figured it out. Sabbath represents 14% of your work week or available week. That's a lot. That means they were saying, we're going to step back from 14% of our business. There's not a lot of businesses that, that like to do that. You know, I looked it up, and there are 17 major companies in America that shut down on Sundays as Sabbath to the Lord. And it's an amazing sort of thing. You know some of them, like Chick-fil-A is one of them. And they're really paying the price. They're really doing bad because of that, aren't they? If you're like me, just try to drive, drive out Wickham Road sometimes out to I-95 and you cannot pass because of the cars that are coming all the way out onto the road. I think they're doing pretty well. Most crowded spot in the, in the malls when you see it there. And um, Hobby Lobby does the same thing. They, they just say, no, we're going to close. Why? But because it's, it's what the Lord has called us to do. And it's the Lord's day. But also because it's good for families. I remember some years ago, um, I, I had a very close friend, uh, Dan Wooten. You may remember, do any of you remember Warren Wooten Ford up on 520? And 520 was kind of the, the, auto, play, the auto road, the, all, all these dealerships there. There's also ones on US 1. It was the place. And I, I didn't know this. I looked it up, though. Warren Wooten Ford was the, only the second Ford dealership in all of Florida. It goes way back. 1915, it was established. And Warren, it's now called Paradise Ford, but Dan Wooten was a prayer partner of mine, and, uh, and he really struggled over this thing of being open on Sundays. A lot of people like to shop for cars on Sundays. They do. It's one of the days you go out. And he gathered together all the owners, all the heads of the dealerships, because he could. His name was, allowed him to be a leader. He, he got them all together, and he said, guys, could we agree to close on Sundays? All of our families need that. All the families of all of our people need that to close on Sunday. And we'll just, if we all agree, then nobody's, you know, get, people can shop for their car on Saturday. They can come after work one day. They can do, they, they'll be able to buy a car. And so they, went, they did it. They, they all closed. He had done this actually a couple of times. And then he said, after a few months, one would open. Yeah, and then another one. And then another one, they would say, we, we, we can't give all of our business to that guy down there and that guy down there. And pretty soon they were all open again. It's a really hard thing in business. Chick-fil-A uh, every week says, if you want something to eat on Sunday, you got to go somewhere else. 14% of our, you know, and maybe more on a weekend. But, but it's a commitment that's made. And that's what they were talking about here. They also were talking about what we call a sabbatical year. Uh, in verse 31, and we will forego the crops of the seventh year. We will let the land rest and exaction of every debt. In the Torah, it was prescribed that the land was to lie fallow during the whole seventh year. You just didn't plant, 
You didn't, you didn't plow, you didn't do anything. And some stuff would grow anyway, because it will. And that was to be left for the poor to come and to pick that up and to take. And, and so there was this foregoing of the crops in that seventh year and the exaction of debts in, in uh, Exodus 23. For six years you shall uh, sow your land and gather its yield, but in the seventh year you shall let it rest and lay fallow. And then in Deuteronomy 15, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of every debt. In this manner of the release, every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. Wow. I don't even know how you would work that. Seems like it'd be really hard to get a loan in the sixth year, knowing it was going to be forgiven. And then you had to forgive it in the seventh year. I mean, how do you work this? And sometimes just, you know, we get all upset about, about education loans and forgiving education loans, and I know that's really political, but right here in the Bible, it talks about releasing loans, releasing debt. Part of it is because in that time, they actually would sometimes indenture their children to pay a debt. You can't pay your debt, then your child will be a servant on my land in my house, and in the seventh year, you got your kid back. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not so good. (laughs) But that's what that Sabbath year is is all about. It's also the basis for an academic sabbatical where a tenured professor, after seven years, gets one whole year of sabbatical year. And I found that interesting because some of the universities and colleges might say, you know, we don't believe in the Bible, we don't don't want the Bible around here, we don't want any of that, that doesn't have anything to do with us. Oh, so you're going to give up your sabbatical year, you professors. Oh, no, I didn't say that. Do you know where it comes from? You should look it up. It comes from our Bible. You ought to read it. Very important. There's also uh, many churches have a pastoral sabbatical uh, of three or four months in or after seven years uh, to study and to renew and to seek vision. That's where all, this is where all of this comes from. The third area was support of the temple. So basically, they've rebuilt the the city, and it's all set there. And they say, okay, we've rebuilt the temple for worship and sacrifice, and we've rebuilt the city around the temple, but how are we going to support the temple? Where do we get the wood for all these fires? Where do we get the animals for these sacrifices? Where where do we get the grain, the grain offerings, all of these things? Uh, Where is that going to come from? And apparently it, was, it had been neglected. They had been going for a while. And probably some people were saying, hey, we, we got to pitch in here. And the truth is, places of worship require maintenance and they require operation. Uh, Pastor Paul was talking about that last weekend. Well, I'm not going to turn this into a, a financial uh, message, but we, we talked about that, how you look around and there are things that need to be fixed, things that need to be cleaned and, and so forth. Um, so there were three, actually three forms of support that are talked about here. And the first, I'll just call basic support. One third of a shekel was committed uh, to the essential support for the operation of the temple. It's just like we need the basics here. Necessary supplies, uh, regular things that need to be done. Uh, showbread and grain offerings, burnt offerings, the wood and all of that sort of thing. It's a practicality in the place of worship. Uh, and, and these basics are needed. By the time Jesus is, is around 500 years later, we're going to talk about that next week. By the time Jesus uh, is around, it, had, it was a half a shekel. It was a little bit more, not a third, but a half of a shekel. And, uh, and they came around asking him, are you going to pay this? They call it the temple tax. And so, uh, and he said, sure, yeah, let, let's, pay, let's pay. And he had a way of paying it. It's interesting because I've observed over the years that modern synagogues, they charge a membership fee. If you're going to be a member of the synagogue, you're a new family in town, you want to be a part, a member of the synagogue, they charge between two and three thousand dollars per family to be a member. That's not tithing, that's not a gift, that's not charity, that's just the operation of the synagogue. So that continues to today. Next, they committed the first of everything. It's called first fruits. First fruits of the ground, every tree, year by year, to the house of the Lord. And actually in this would have been the oil for the lampstand in the temple. I I was fascinated when I learned a little bit more about this, um, that we hear about olive oil, regular olive oil, and then we hear about virgin 
olive oil, which is the first, the first of it, the most pure. And then extra virgin uh, olive oil is the most pure of the pure. And for the lamp that's in the temple, it's the first few drops of the first pressing. Only the first few drops was gathered from the first pressing of the olives. It had to be that special and that pure. It's kind of amazing. And it's a way of saying, God, you are first in our lives. Because we're, we're going to make sure that the first things are given to you, including firstborn of our sons and our cattle. I don't know why but they put those both in the same, same sentence, but <laughs> okay. Uh, the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law. And actually, the firstborn son was presented to the temple as a gift and then redeemed, bought back. Jesus was bought back by his parents, by his earthly parents. Uh, and, and that was what happened. The first of our dough, our contributions, uh, the fruit of every tree, the wine, the oil, all, all of this. And finally, a tithe. A tithe, and that just is the word for tenth. Uh, bring, the Levi, bring to the Levites the tithes from our gra- ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. Levites didn't get any land. When they divided up the land, they didn't get any land. They said, you're going to live everywhere. And then they received the tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of God, to the chambers of the storehouse, so there will be food in the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are. And it's going to help with all of these different aspects of worship. So the tithe and the Sabbath are actually both incredible matters of faith and trust. Think about this for a minute. If you observe the Sabbath, whatever day you observe it, we, I, I observe Sabbath on Monday because that's the only day I, I can grab. You know, I work all weekend. So on Monday... Uh, I'm, I am on Sabbath and to the Lord and with my family and to rest. So where, whenever you do that, but by observing the Sabbath, we're trusting God to supply all that we need from six days of gathering, six days of work, even though that's 14% less than the other people that are working seven days a week. And bringing the tithe trusts God to meet all of our needs from nine-tenths of the blessing we've received. So we're going to return one day a week to God, 14%. We're going to return one-tenth of the blessing to God, 10%. And trust that God is going to keep blessing. And God's going to meet our needs. Final words of the covenant are, we will not neglect the house of our God. Apparently, that's what had been going on. That's a big deal. They have been neglecting the house of the Lord. Pastor Paul talked about that a little bit last, last weekend, about how we're beginning um, over the next uh, month and a half or so, a commitment over the next year uh, to bring an additional offering uh, for the, the house of God. Every once in a while, I talk to someone and they'll say um, something like this. They'll say, I want my money to go to missions. I want all my money to go to missions because I believe in missions. I'm glad you believe in missions. I've never said this, but I've been very tempted to say, you don't like air conditioning? I like air conditioning. Some of you know that. Uh, You you don't like water that's running in the house of worship? Uh, You don't like for things to be vacuumed and cleaned up? You don't like uh, a microphone that works when we need a microphone that works? You You don't like for the restrooms to be clean and tidy when you go in? You don't care about that? Does it bother you if there's no toilet paper in our restrooms? Bothers me. You know, we go on some of these uh, journeys, these big trips, and, uh, and they tell us in advance, you just need to know, you need to bring your own toilet paper. B-Y-O-T-P. It is not in there. <laughs> but, and, I, and, and if you think about it, sometimes toilet paper is every bit as holy as, you know, the mission gift that we give important when somebody's coming to hear for the first time and they want to they're going to receive the word of the lord these things are important it was about the same time that the prophet malachi was preaching and we sometimes we pull malachi out of context but this is the context 
And he writes the word of the Lord. God is speaking, and he says in Malachi chapter 3, it's familiar to many of us, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And then on on in verse 10, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. The only place in the whole Bible where, where God says, test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour out for you a blessing until there is no more need. So God says, test me in this. Now, it's very interesting because God did not say, now, you need to repent. You need to pay back everything you've stolen. He didn't say that. I, want, I once had a friend, and he, he had been a very successful attorney. And uh, he had been an attorney not a real long time, maybe eight or ten years. And he dramatically came, got saved. He came to the Lord, and he said, I think I'm being called into ministry. And he said, I'm going to get ready to train for ministry. I'm going to head, head to seminary. He said, but i got a few things to, to get done first. And he set out, he told me this, he said, I I am going to pay back all of the tithes that I have not given over the last 10 years since God has been blessing me in my law practice. I'm going to give it all, I'm going to go back. And he calculated it, how much much he was going to repay to God. I said to him, you don't have to do that. It's not the way repentance works. God never says, all right, now go back and pay back. Never says that. He says, move forward turn, change. But he said, the Lord put it on my heart. And I said, well, if the Lord's put it on your heart, then you should do it. He did it. It Took him about three years. I mean, it was hard for him, but he paid back all of the tithes that he had not given during that time. It's an amazing thing. I don't suggest that. I mean, I guess if the Lord puts something on your heart, then you should do what the Lord puts on your heart. I mean, how would we pay back some things? You need to pay back all of the Sabbaths you have not taken? No. Impossible. So we move forward, and really, repentance is always about moving forward. Now, if you stole something and you need to pay it back, or swindled someone, of course, you need to make a restitution, but that's different. We need to understand offering is central to worship. It's a central part of worship. In Deuteronomy 16, uh, the Lord said, They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. We're not to come empty-handed. So this fifth element of revival, we talked last weekend about revival, is repentance. And what does repentance look like for us? Probably different. Probably different from these things. We we need to say, God, what is it that you want to change in my, what do you want me to change? Where do you want me to meet you in that change? So what does that look like? The Hebrew word, I know some of you really want some Hebrew. Pastor Jeff, when's the Hebrew coming? Come on. Hebrew, Hebrew. And, and the word is shub. Say that with me, shub. And this is the, the word that means turn, turn back, retreat, return. And I've often illustrated it. You know, if you're, going, if you're going south on I-95 and you're trying to get to Jacksonville, what have you got to do? You have to turn around. You will shub. <laughs> That's right. You've got to get going in the right direction. And this is where this comes from, this part of the definition. But the New Testament word, the Greek word is metanoia. Say that with me, metanoia. It means to think differently, to have a change of mind and heart, to reconsider. Part of it, it means to remember. If you're going south on I-95 and you remember, I'm supposed to be going to Jacksonville. That's part of this, to have a change of mind. But it's even more than that. It's to think differently about your sin to think differently about how it grieves God. There's a verse, it's not in your notes, but I I came across it, it's so powerful. Joel 2.13, if you want to jot it down, says, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. How powerful is that? to turn and have a change in our heart. The biblical definition of repentance is both. It's a change of direction 
and it's a change of heart, change of mind. Think about it this way. If you change your mind, but you don't turn around, that's not repentance. I'm really grieved by what I did, but I'm not going to change it. I'm going to keep doing it. That's not repentance, right? And also, if you have a, a change of, of, your, of your direction, you say, well, I'm going I'm to quit doing that because that's not working. I turn around, but I have not grieved the sin. That's not repentance either. You know, sometimes I've counseled uh, people about freedom from pornography. And uh, one of the things I've, I've talked with men about sometimes They say, I just struggle with this. I struggle with this. I can't seem to get away from it. I say, "Uh, put this in your mind. Think about that image. When you click that image, think about that image, that woman as your daughter. If you clicked on that and you saw your daughter's face there, how would that gut wrench you and grieve you? That's how God feels all the time about this very destructive thing. Think about this as uh, a... someone who is going to one day be a wife and will struggle with this for the rest of her life probably. Hopefully she'll find healing. But we'll struggle with what? I mean, we've seen suicides in the news that come out of that industry, that horrible industry. Huge damage is done. So if we will seek the heart of God on these things, it's very powerful. Repentance is a change of direction and a change of mind. So how do we do that? What are the steps to true repentance? I just want to, these are in your notes. I'll share these with you very quickly. And the first is confess your sin. We talked about that last weekend. 1 John 1, 9. Let's read this out loud together. It's such a great truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a a happy verse. The second is to Seek and to have godly sorrow for our sins. Second Corinthians 7 says, For godly grief, that, to, to share the grief that God has over sin, uh, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. It's not just being upset about things. The third is to turn from sin with God's help. Isaiah 59 says, and a redeemer will come to Zion. That's what we're celebrating next week and the following week. A redeemer comes to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from their transgression, declares the Lord. That's where we find our redemption. And the fourth is to choose holiness every day. Jeremiah 15, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you and you shall stand before me. Let's read that out loud together. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you and you shall stand before me. There's a marvelous prayer of repentance in the Bible. Uh, It's in Psalm 51. It's confession and repentance. As as David, um, he had committed horrible things. He had committed adultery and then he had killed the husband of the woman that he had adultery with. And it it was just the worst of the worst. He's confronted with that, and he realizes how this is heartbreaking and grievous to God. And he he wrote this prayer. And I want us, just because it's good to pray Scripture, to pray this out loud together. I invite you as we close um, this message. Uh, So let's put it up there. And uh, will you join me in praying uh, the prayer of confession and repentance? Let's pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even from the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. 
Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, for you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jericho. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. God, we thank you that you call us home. You call our hearts to be turned back home to you. And we thank you that you empower that turn and you empower the changing of our minds, our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.